Exposure controls. This is the big one, everybody. In here, we're gonna be talking about shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, and everything else regarding the exposure. Now, before we start diving into all the important stuff in here, you gotta check the photo video switch on the back of your camera. Just wanna remind you that if you are in the video mode, the camera operates in a very different mode. Uh, we'll be talking about video later on in this class in section nine, but for now, you wanna make sure that you are in the photo mode. Yes, I am in the photo mode. Uh, and that way the camera will work for taking still photographs. All right, let's get into it. Let's talk about the exposure mode options on this camera, and that is gonna be adjusted by pressing the mode button over on the left-hand shoulder of the camera and turning the main command dial. And so this is one of those buttons that you have to keep pressing down while you are turning the dial. Just pressing the button itself doesn't do anything. It's kind of a safety protocol that they have in there. So we're gonna start with the easiest of all the different options. There's not really that many options. On, uh, on lower end cameras, they give you a lot of different options, but on more serious cameras like this, there's usually just a few options that people have. And in this case, the easiest option is the program mode. Program means the camera is going to set shutter speeds and apertures, and that's it. So it's gonna take care of those two things, and you have access and can change everything else. We will be talking about ISO in just a few minutes here, uh, and that's something that you're gonna set separately. Uh, but when you're in the program mode, one of the things that you'll wanna do is take a look in the viewfinder or on the monitor on the back of the camera and take a look at your shutter speeds and apertures that the camera is providing you. This will let you know if it's appropriate for the type of subject that you are shooting. Now, when you are in the program mode, what you can do is you can then turn that main command dial to adjust what's known as the flexible program. And this allows you to adjust the shutter speeds and apertures in combination uh, at the same time to give yourself either shallower depth of field, more depth of field, faster shutter speed, or slower uh, shutter speed. Now these are not locked in. These are going to adjust as the brightness of your subject uh, it gets lighter or darker. And so these are things that you don't really fix in. It's just something that you kind of adjust the camera and steer it towards in that direction. It's not locking in like it is in a manual mode. Let me go ahead and show you a little bit more about how this works. All right, let's get our cameras set up on our target here. And so I'm gonna press the mode button on the top of the camera. I'm gonna turn the rear dial and I'm gonna dial through until I see the P, which is the program mode. So we're in the program mode. I currently have ISO 800 set up, which works pretty good here in the studio. And you can see that the camera is giving us a shutter speed of 125th and f5.6. If I said, you know, I think I might need a little bit more depth of field, we can go ahead and dial that. I'm gonna quickly change the amount of uh, display information here so that we can see just the right amount here. All right, so if I uh, dial this, uh, back dial to the right, you can see that we've gone down to f4 at 3 20th of a second. If I want to go the other direction, let's say we want to get to f16. Uh, okay, uh, there we go, f16. Now, as I move the camera around, that slips to f14, comes back to 16, goes down to 14. You can see it doesn't stay locked in it just kind of gets you in that region and will try to stay somewhat close to that region. So this is good when you have a light need to have something in a particular area. Now, there is a unusual quirk about how Nikon cameras work, and I don't understand why no other camera does this. It seems like it's a mistake and nobody's realized it for years and years and years. But let me, uh, let me show you what this little quirk is. All right, let's say we want to go down to F4. Okay, so we the right direction. We're going to go down to F4. And okay, so this is the limit. This is an F4 lens. This is as far as we can go. But let's just say we accidentally turn the dial one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in that direction. All right. Well, you would think if we came back, it would go higher than F4, but it doesn't do anything. That's one click, and two clicks, three clicks, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, now we're finally uh, getting back to changing this uh, flexible program. And so what happens is it appears that the camera just keeps recording the clicks beyond it. And 
you'll turn the dial and nothing happens. And so you just have to go really far in one direction. A potential other solution would be to turn the camera off and turn the camera on, and the camera is going to reset back to the middle of a generic program mode, which is just kind of a in-between aperture and in-between shutter speed, uh, whatever is appropriate for the light and the ISO that you have. And so program mode is probably not the mode that most people are going to use on this camera a lot of the time, uh, but I imagine a lot of people will use it some of the time. Next up is shutter priority. This is where you get to select the shutter speed and the camera will figure out the aperture. Once again, ISO is kind of a separate issue. You can have manual ISO set or you can have automatic ISO set. Um, and that gets into a little bit more advanced talk that we don't have time for right now, but because we want to talk about shutter priority. And if you want to capture something that's moving very quickly, like an eagle coming into a river, yep, a thousandth of a second or faster might be necessary to stop that motion. You want to blur the river itself? Well, maybe one second or something even longer. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons why you want to be very particular about your shutter speed that you are choosing. Now, there's something you do have to be careful for, and that is an aperture that is blinking. When you are in the shutter priority mode and the aperture blinks at you, what that means is that you do not have an aperture appropriate for the lighting of that particular subject. Let me show you exactly what I mean in this case. So let's go ahead and get lined up. I'm going to change our exposure mode to shutter priority here. And you can see that we now have control of our shutter speed with our dial in the back of the camera. And if we want to select a shutter speed of a 60th of a second, right now we're at F9, and that works just fine. If we want to go to a faster shutter speed, Let's go to a thousandth of a second. You'll see that F4 is blinking and the exposure indicator over on the right hand side of the frame is showing us almost a two stop exposure, uh, underexposure. We can go ahead and we can shoot a photo if we want. I believe I have a self timer activated right now. We can go ahead and play back that image and we can see that we got ourselves a very dark image and we can uh, look at that and see that we are definitely on the dark side of things. And this is something that you have to be concerned about when you are in a shutter priority mode. Now, the solution to this, well, there's a couple different solutions. Number one is bring it back down to a normal shutter speed where it's not blinking at you. Right here, I'm going to quickly get out of the self-timer mode. And so I can shoot a photo now. And I can look at that photo and it looks like a normal exposure, which is good. Now, the other option, if I wanted to stay at a thousandth of a second, is I could increase my ISO. And I can look at that exposure indicator over on the right hand side of the screen. Let's uh, go ahead and get my. You can see how we can get it up there and we can get a normal exposure right there. Now, a third option to fixing this particular problem in here is I could set my ISO to auto ISO and it will automatically jump up according to whatever it thinks it needs. I'm going to turn that off for right now. So there's three different ways around the issue of getting the exposure you want. Um, one is lowering the shutter speed and then the other is raising the ISO either manually or doing it automatically. All right, next up is aperture priority. Now, this is one of the modes that I particularly like for a lot of general purpose type work. This is where you get to choose the aperture. The camera will figure out the shutter speed. Now, there are just so many different shutter speeds that are available. What this really means in reality is no matter what aperture you choose, you're almost always going to have an available shutter speed for getting that exposure. Now, whether it's appropriate for hand holding, well, that's a different issue. But aperture priority is really nice when you want to get lots of depth of field. You stop the aperture down to f16, 22, or wherever else necessary for that particular shot. And you can get everything from the foreground to the background in focus. You want to shoot with really shallow depth of field so that your subject stands out from the background. Uh, set it to 1.4, 2, 2, 8, whatever your lens happens to have. Now, it is possible that you will not have an appropriate shutter speed. But it's exceedingly rare with a top shutter speed of 32,000th of a second, 
even with shooting a very fast lens in very bright light, this is unlikely to have happen. But aperture priority, as I say, is a nice easy mode to use. Let's go ahead and take a look at that in action. So we're gonna go ahead and press the mode button down, go to the right, and we are in aperture priority. So right now at F4, we're getting 2 50th of a second. If I wanted a bit more depth of field, I'm changing the wrong dial. I need to change the front dial because that's our default aperture button on this camera, the dial on this camera. So we can dial in any particular aperture we want. F22, we're at an eighth of a second. And F4, we're at 2 50th of a second. And so uh, we do also have a little bit of that clicky problem when it goes past. Uh, it's not as bad as in the program mode. It's sometimes just, I don't know, it doesn't register a click or two. So sometimes you'll click a couple past. You'll click back one and it won't actually register. Uh, but generally it's, it's pretty responsive in that particular case. And so this is a great travel photography mode when you don't know what your next shot is. You can just set it to a middle aperture, keep an eye on the shutter speed to make sure it's appropriate for your hand holding of the camera, as well as how much your subject might be moving around. And I think that's a real easy one for people to use. And so uh, that's kind of a nice one just to store it in the camera bag with it on, because you know you can turn the camera on uh, real quickly, grab a quick shot of almost anything. All right, next up is full manual exposure. This is where you are choosing shutter speeds and apertures. And kind of on a secondary note, you're choosing ISOs manually or automatically if you want. But I like manual exposure because when you choose a subject and you set up your shutter speeds and apertures and you shoot a variety of compositions, you're going to get the same consistent lighting uh, with each of your shots. And so if the lighting's not changing, and so you're out in the middle of the day or you're inside where they're not changing the lights on you, you can just set up whatever shutter speed and aperture is appropriate for that situation and have consistent results. So you don't, you don't have to be fixing individual images later on in post-production. This is also really nice when you are working with scenes of extreme or excessive brightness or darkness. And this is uh, the type of area that the metering system may or may not do a great job on because there is either so much area of blackness or the brights are so bright in comparison to everything else. And so this is something that I really like working with because I like to get it dialed in exactly where I want it. And then I can get a whole bunch of consistent quality shots, uh, no matter how tricky the lighting is. So if you are going to be doing manual exposure, you're going to be working with the exposure indicator, which is this little graph at the bottom of the viewfinder right in the middle. But on the monitor, it's going to be over on the right hand side. And you see it's in different places, so you just have to be aware of that. Nikon traditionally and a lot of other high-end cameras have often put the light meter over on the right hand side. That's kind of a hallmark of a high-end camera. I don't know that it's better. It's just that's kind of a hallmark of high-end cameras. They work the same. Uh, it just depends on whether you're talking up, down, or left, or right. Now, as I say, work the same. What they're going to show you is what a proper exposure is going to be. They show you in third stops and full stop increments as to how over or underexposed you are. And so one and two thirds of a stop overexpose, for instance. And if you go too far in either direction, you're going to end up with an arrow that's letting you know that you're more than three stops off in either direction. And generally speaking, most of the time you're going to want to start at least manual exposing with an even exposure and then you may need to make an adjustment according to how bright or dark your particular subject is. Now when it comes to selecting the shutter speeds I want to give you some little bit of additional information here. Camera has some very fast shutter speeds 16,000, 32,000 is the top shutter speed. It goes down to 30 seconds like all good cameras have for a very long period of time. And in between these whole shutter speeds are third stops. Now they actually, uh, there's quite a few of these. I'm not gonna list them all. They clutter up my screen, but they're there. You'll see them and you will be dial past, dial past them. So each time you click, you're going one third of a stop. One of the special shutter speeds is 200th of a second because that is the flash synchronization speed, which means that's the fastest shutter speed that you can use a standard TTL flash on this camera. It is possible to fire with flashes faster than that. It goes into a special FP mode on uh, Nikon flashes. We're not gonna get into that right now, but it is possible, but it's gonna be in a manual mode 
this is going to be in an automatic computer controlled mode that it can handle and adjust the amount of light 200th of a second or slower anything slower be a 30th of a second it could be a full second and the flashes and cameras can work that out when you go beyond that you will eventually get to something called bulb bulb is a long time exposure where the shutter stays open as long as your finger is on the button and this can be good if you want to do a shutter speed of 60 seconds for instance uh, this is how cameras have worked for a long time and this allows you to be very versatile when you start the exposure and when you end the exposure so this might work for shooting fireworks for instance if you don't know how long you want to leave the shutter open for now there is also a time option and time is nice because you can just press the button once to get started and then you don't have to leave your finger on the shutter release or on a cable release which would be better because you don't want to be moving the camera and then you can come back to the camera when you're done and you can press the shutter release again and that ends the exposure so bulb and time they do the same thing they just operate in a slightly different manner now Nikon has something called extended shutter speeds, which I think is fantastic. If you like to do nighttime exposures, I've always thought, why do they limit us to 30 seconds? Why can't they give us longer shutter speeds? It's not that hard. And Nikon does that. This is something that you do need to go into the custom settings menu to turn on. And then you can go to these special, very long shutter speeds. So if you do nighttime work, this is something I would highly recommend turning on. Uh, the big warning on this, though, is that the light meter does not work when you go into these long shutter speed modes. You'll see that the exposure indicator just disappears and you don't see it anymore. So you can't use it. So you'll need to be basing your exposures on something shorter and then extrapolating out. You know, if it was half as bright as it should be, you're going to double the time or by just doing some practice exposures, which you may need to do in some tricky nighttime situations. Now, these shutter speeds are a little bit weird and here's what I've noticed is that the camera works in third stop shutter speeds as we've mentioned so 15 20 25 30 I know technically not exactly a third but they're close enough and that's that's what we call it now you go into the extended shutter speeds and what happens there well we go 60 90 120 on and upward and that series of numbers is a little bit funny because normally our normal shutter speeds are third stop increments and then from 30 to 60, it changes in a one stop increment. And then from there on, it does it in half stop increments. I don't know why they did this, but if you're, you know, flipping dials and turning the shutter speed, uh, you got to realize that it's going third stop, third stop, one stop, half stop, half stop, half stop. Uh, and that could really mess with how you are adjusting your apertures if you're doing one click for one click when you're doing your uh, exposure adjustments. So just be aware of that if you're getting into long exposures, there's nothing really, well, maybe it is a little bit wrong. There's nothing totally wrong with it. It's just a little bit funky and it's the way it's set up. But bulb exposures, nighttime exposures, a lot of fun to do getting out there and uh, doing light trails with car headlamps. And there's all sorts of creative things that you can do. So if you haven't done that type of work, highly encourage you to get out there and do something a little experimental and creative. Uh, let's go ahead and do a final example with our manual exposure in here. Just show you around a little bit in here. So we're going to go ahead and press the mode button and go to the right here. And now we are in full manual exposure. Now, as you can see over here on the right hand side, the indicator is showing us uh, we are really dark right now. So we need to let in some more light. So changing our shutter speed uh, might be a good first step. And so if I turn this back dial, I can get it down to uh, a reasonable shutter speed, let's say 125th of a second. And I got a little, I got a third of a stop more to go. And I can do that with the aperture. So at f5.6, we're getting what's uh, considered to be a normal exposure. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. Let's just make a slight little adjustment here. And to be honest with you, this still looks a little dark. And that's because that cabinet in front of me has a lot of white. And so it's, brighter than average and the camera's indicator is that you know this is this is a correct exposure for an average brightness subject but this subject is brighter than average so what I might do is I might make a further adjustment of a third stop or even two-thirds of a stop to have this image overexposed because this image is a brighter than average exposure and I think that is probably going to be a better exposure 
than the one with the even exposure. That even exposure, that line at zero, is simply a recommendation. It's a really, really good place to start. And it's, it's hard to imagine a situation that you're going to mess up by setting it at zero. But you can do better than zero sometimes by really adjusting it and reading whether your subject is brighter than average or darker than average and kind of dialing that in. And so uh, that's, that's kind of a thing that you just need to know and be able to adjust when you're out in the field. All right, so there you go. Those are our four exposure modes, and that's basically it. All right, let's talk about ISO. ISO is controlling the sensitivity of the sensor. This is often going to be something that you use when you get to lower light situations, especially when you are needing to bump up your shutter speed. That's kind of the main motivating reason is that you need a faster shutter speed, and so you're going to bump up the ISO. So the ISO on this camera can go from 32 all the way up to 102,000. 64 is the native ISO. So that is the optimum setting and where you would ideally have your setting, ISO setting all the time. Uh, don't always get that opportunity in the real world, but that's the ideal, all right? So you press the ISO button. This is one of those safety protocol buttons where you have to keep the button pressed down while you are turning the back dial to change the particular setting on it. So like always, I'm going to throw this camera through my normal ISO test where I'm suiting a test subject at different ISOs to take a look at the quality. And ISO 64 is where you are going to get the best information. Now you can set it lower than 64 to 32. It's called low one. It's one stop lower than the native sensitivity of the camera. That's why it's called low one. And this is not as good as 64. It's going to have about one stop less dynamic range. And so you're going to maybe see that your highlights clipped a little bit more easily when you are shooting this. The only time I do this is when I'm really desperate for longer shutter speeds. If I'm shooting a waterfall and I'm really trying to get to that extra long shutter speed, I can see myself going from 64 down to 32. Now on this camera, in my opinion, Everything 1600 below is looking extremely good. Nikon has a very good processor in here. It is still a 45 megapixel camera, which has a lot of pixels in there. So they're relatively small pixels, but overall performance from the sensor is quite good. As we look into the higher ISOs, yeah, it gets a little rough there, especially in those high one and high two settings. And so 6400 and below is where things are still looking pretty clean in my opinion. So the highest numbered setting is 25,600, and then it's technically called high one and high two, and it's just double and quadruple those numbers. And I think what's happening in that case is that the camera is just simply using software to make the image brighter, and there is a notable drop off in quality when you go to those high one and high two settings. But, you know, as always in photography, you're trying to keep the lowest ISO possible so long as the other settings are where you want them to be. Now, while you can change the ISO setting with the back dial, you can turn the camera into auto ISO on and off by turning the front dial on the camera. Let me go ahead and show you how this works real quickly here. So once again, we're going to be pressing the ISO button on the front of the camera. And if we turn the back, it's pretty obvious what happens. We change the ISO of the camera and that's fine. Now, if we turn the front dial, it's a little bit harder with the finger dials. Uh, we can turn it on and off. And so it's just simply one click, one direction, and then back the other to go on and off. And so when you see that auto there at the bottom in yellow, that means it's in auto ISO. And you can have the camera in auto ISO in any of the ex other exposure modes. And so, uh, for instance, in shutter priority, I mentioned that using auto ISO might be a good way of kind of making sure that you have the appropriate uh, aperture setting and shutter setting. You can set your shutter speed up in shutter priority to say a thousandth of a second for bird photography, set your aperture fairly wide open, maybe 5.6 and put it in auto ISO and you can just track the birds wherever they go. And you know, you have the shutter speed that you want. Uh, you know that you're at the aperture you want and the camera is just going to adjust the ISO. Now, in reality, that's not all that different than just setting the camera up manually, selecting your shutter speed, selecting your aperture, and then having auto ISO uh, turned on. 
And auto ISO is something a lot of photographers use. Uh, it can be helpful in many situations where the light is changing and you are shooting very quickly from one area to the, to the next. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like using it as well. So it's not a, uh, a one thing covers everybody case. And so test it out, see how you like it yourself. Now, if you want to get into some of the detailed specifications of the ISO about how the auto works, you can go into the photo shooting menu under ISO sensitivity settings, and you'll be able to set up at what shutter speeds does the camera start bumping up to higher ISOs, and what is the top ISO that you would like the camera to use. And so we'll cover this a little bit further in section 12 in this class. All right, next up, let's talk about the exposure compensation. And so this is a way of quickly making photos lighter and darker. You'll do that by pressing the plus minus button and you can turn either the main or the sub command dial on the front of the camera. This is where you typically have the camera in an aperture priority, shutter priority, or program mode, and you are not happy with how bright your subject is. You can simply brighten it very easily by pressing the button and turning one of the dials. Now you will see this expressed in two different ways, either in the exposure indicator in a graphic manner or in a numeric value uh, with the exposure value, depending on where you are looking at this information. You might see a plus one, for instance, or a minus two stop if you want to get it quite a bit darker. Normally though, you want to make sure that you have this left at zero because that's the default setting for this. Now, as I say, this can work in program, shutter priority, and aperture priority, but it can also be used in manual. So let's go ahead and take a look at this and I'll show you how I might use it. All right, so in this particular case, we talked about shooting this subject and that it was a little bit lighter than average. And if I was going to manually uh, work with this subject, let's make sure I am not in auto ISO right now. I'm at normal exposure. I think this is a brighter than average exposure, so I might go up a third or two thirds of a stop by adjusting the shutter speed or aperture. But this is in a manual mode. If I was to be in a aperture priority mode, the camera is automatically giving me what it thinks is a proper exposure. And if I don't like that, I can press the plus minus button on the top of the camera and I can add in a two thirds of exposure increment right there. Now this will also show it to us in the viewfinder and we can see it there on the back of the camera with that exposure compensation. But we want to make sure that we turn this off when we're done getting the shot because we may not want that with all the subjects that we shoot at. Now, one of the things that Nikon allows us to do, it's not available on most cameras, is in manual exposure, you can set exposure compensation. Uh, let's say we are shooting a subject that normally has uh, is two thirds of a stop brighter than average. Let's make it one stop just to make it easy. What we can do is we can go into exposure compensation and we can say, okay, we want you to now meter anything one stop over as a normal exposure. All right, so now as I adjust my exposure in here and I get it to zero, I'm actually a stop overexposed because that's what I have dialed in to the exposure compensation. Now, this is a little strange in my opinion. I, I understand there's a need for it. I'm glad the camera has it and I hope some people make use of it. Uh, this is kind of the equivalent to me of people who set their clocks 10 minutes ahead of time. They know that they always run 10 minutes late, so they're gonna set the clock 10 minutes ahead of time so they actually end up where they're going on time. Uh, you don't need this in the camera. Uh, for instance, uh, let's uh, go back here to a normal exposure. And so I am in manual. I have the camera set up in a manual exposure and I take a photo. All right, so that's one photo. Now I'm gonna go in and I'm going to dial in a plus one exposure compensation. It just simply affects my light meter. It doesn't affect the actual photo. If I take a photo and I play back the last two photos, this one had a plus one on the exposure compensation. I can't show you that right now. Um, and if I go back to the previous image, which was not with the exposure compensation, it looks exactly the same. So photo number 10 and photo number 11 had the difference of exposure compensation, but because it was done in manual, it doesn't have any real effect on your photos. It just has an effect on the exposure indicator and the information that you see. And it's whether 
you follow that guided information as to whether it's going to make any difference in your final photo. And so it is available to use, but just remember in all cases, reset it back to zero. Which I'm just going to double check right now. I'm good. Because uh, you don't want that mistakenly turned on when you're doing other things. Now, the exposure compensation is one of those buttons that you have to press down while you are turning either the front or the back dial. There is something called easy exposure compensation in the custom settings menu. And what this allows you to do is to change the way that the exposure compensation button works, in which case you don't even need to press the button. You see, when you are in shutter, pri shutter priority or aperture priority, you are changing your primary control, shutter speeds with the back dial, apertures with the front dial. That other dial, the opposing one, doesn't do anything in the normal mode with the camera. In this case, it allows you to turn that unused dial it with exposure compensation. So if you are constantly changing it and you don't like pressing the button, this makes it a little bit easier to set your exposure compensation. And so uh, it's an interesting option. I don't think a lot of people use it, but if you use it a lot, that can help you and save you just a little bit of time. The metering system in the camera is how the camera determines what is the correct exposure. And there are four different metering systems that you can use in the camera, but most people actually end up sticking with matrix metering, which is Nikon's most sophisticated metering system. It's using tone, color, composition, and even the distance of your subject to figure out the brightness values and how important that particular subject is. Now, this is in general extremely good at mixed lighting easy lighting, pretty much all lighting situations. And so this is one that most people are going to be fine leaving their camera on in the matrix metering mode. Next up is center weighted metering. And this is how a lot of traditional Nikon cameras work, especially back in the 80s and 70s and even earlier. And this is where you will read the light in a center portion of the frame. Now this can be weighted either to 8 or 12 millimeters. You can get into the uh, menu system and you can customize it slightly and this is a fairly tight center weighted metering in there so that if your subjects in the middle of the frame it's just kind of reading that light and not the light around the edges if you want to get more precise there is the spot metering which is using only 1.5 percent of the frame so if your subject is very small in the frame surrounded by areas of brightness or darkness you can really get an accurate reading over that particular subject. And this is maybe the most accurate of all the tools, but it is a little bit dangerous to use because if you forget that it's in use, it can really cause a lot of problems. And so you need to be very careful with this usage. There is also highlight weighted metering, and this is where the camera just looks for the lightest areas of the image and tries to make sure that they are not all overexposed. And in theory, this is a really good system and good way to expose because with digital cameras, if you overexpose and you blow out the highlights, there's really no recovering from it. And so making sure that your highlight areas are within the realm of the exposure, that's a very good thing. And so if for some reason matrix metering is not working, I would encourage you to try this highlight weighted uh, metering system. I think it's going to be very good in some scenarios. It's not what I recommend for everybody, but it's a, it's a good thing to experiment with to see if it can help you out if you are getting tricky exposures and having trouble with the metering system. All right, one of the best ways for determining if you got the correct exposure is with the histogram. And this is something that you can see with the display button. It can show you a brightness histogram, which is a graph that shows you whether you are overexposed or underexposed. And as I say, it's just a simple graph and it's really easy to just look at the shape of the graph and get a feel for whether you are overexposed or underexposed. Now you can also see this in the playback mode. So you play back an image and then you can press the info button, go up and down for more or less information, and you will be able to see this. Now here's where my problem with Nikon comes in. Uh, they have this turned off by default at the beginning. Uh, so we're going to go in and we're going to go ahead and turn this on. Now there's a number of different playback options that you can see, and we'll talk more about playback here in a little bit. Uh, but you do need to go into the playback menu, into the playback display options, and check off either overview and or RGB histogram so that you can see this additional information. Let's go ahead and do this right now because this is a really good thing to have available to you.
So we're going to dive into the menu system. I'm going to go to the left and come down to the playback tab. Go to the right, and what we want is playback display options. We're going to go to the right. And there's many things in here, and you could just check everything off if you want. I'm going to choose the RGB histogram and the overview for right now. And uh, let's uh, hit menu for being done. And now when I come back and I play an image, I can go up or down and cycle through different groups of information. And so this is showing me the histogram. It shows me that I haven't overexposed anything because there's nothing uh, over on the right-hand side. There's some dark areas in there. And if I go down one, let's see, if I go up one, then I can get the RGB histogram, which shows me the different color channels, which gives me a little bit more information about uh, clipping in any of those particular channels. And so I find that very helpful when I'm out shooting because sometimes when you're looking at a bright screen on the camera, it's hard to see if you got the right exposure. And this is the technical truth detector when it comes to exposure. And so it's something I rely on quite frequently, as do many other photographers. All right, now something to be aware of with a mirrorless camera like this is the view mode. If you want to determine whether you are overexposed or underexposed, well, probably the best tool in there is the exposure indicator, which lets you know whether you're overexposed or underexposed with the graph. But also just looking at the image on screen. Is it bright or is it dark? Uh, this is the standard way that the camera is set up in the custom settings menu under view mode. Show the effect settings. This is showing you the effects of the settings that you are making. And this is going to be great for most photographers most of the time where you get to see a real world view along with the exposure indicator that lets you know whether you're overexposing or underexposing. Now, there are reasons why you might want to turn this off, which means that the camera is going to give you the best view of your subject at all times. If you are working with strobes or flash photography or in some other unusual situations where you are going to be dealing with your exposure by just looking at the exposure indicator. And so on the right hand side of the screen, you can see I am changing shutter speeds and the picture is not getting any lighter or darker because the camera is wanting to give me the best image possible. And I'm using the exposure indicator as my sole item for determining exposure. Over on the left hand side of the screen, you can actually see the image getting brighter and darker as I change images. And so be aware that there are two different options. Most of the time, show effect settings is going to be good for most people shooting in natural lighting situations. When you start using flash, you go into the studio and a few other special situations. Adjust for ease of viewing might be better off. So be aware of this one. It's an important uh, item that is buried pretty deep in the menu system. Auto exposure lock. So the joystick on the back of the camera is a button. And when you press in on that button, it locks the exposure. Now, this is something that some people use and a lot of people don't use. Uh, it's up to you, but it's uh, one of the customizable buttons on this camera. And so let's uh, go ahead and take a quick look on how this works. We will need to be in a uh, automatic mode. So we're going to go ahead and change this back down to aperture priority. And so right now we're at f4.5. We've got 125th of a second. If we were to rotate over here to the side, uh, we're getting much darker areas in the frame. And so it's dropping down to an 80th of a second. If I want to lock in the shutter speed right here, I'll press this button in and you can see over in the lower left, AEL has come up. And so as I rotate over here, it's locked in that 125th of a second and I can press my shutter release to take a photo with that exposure locked in. And so as you see, as we have that shutter speed adjust, maybe I want to want to lock in that lower one. Uh, actually, let's lock it in over here bring it back and I can lock that exposure in. And so there's a few tricky exposure situations where you might do use this. It's not going to work in manual. It's going to work in the automatic exposure modes like program, shutter priority, and aperture priority. If that's not the type of way that you would like to use that particular button, well, you can go into the custom controls, which we're going to spend a lot of time on later on in this class, and you can reprogram that button to do something more valuable for what you do.
exposure bracketing. Now this kind of looks like exposure compensation, but this is where the camera will automatically run through three or more photos very quickly over and under exposing to make sure that you have the correct exposure. Now there's actually a couple of different reasons that people might use this. Traditionally, it's to ensure that they're walking away with an image that will meet their needs for having the right exposure. But HDR photography for high dynamic range compilation where they compile images together it is also very useful. And there is a bracketing button right on the top of the camera that you can press and you can adjust the number of frames with the command dial in the back or the exposure increment, how far the exposure is apart with the front dial. Now you can also go into the photo shooting menu and dive into auto bracketing from there and you can set up a number of other settings with how this is controlled. First up, you can control what aspect is being bracketed. Normally, it's going to be the exposure. And so the exposure will be automatically adjusted for the different settings. Now, you can combine this with flash if you want. Uh, there is also one for white balance as well as active delighting, which are separate topics that we will cover uh, later on in the class. You can choose the number of shots that you want to get and how far apart those shots are. Traditionally, most people do bracketing in one-stop increments. It seems to be a notable amount, but not too much difference where you can shoot three, five, or more depending on your particular needs. And if you want, you can use exposure compensation with this. So you can get all of your exposures on the darker or the lighter side if you want to. So let's go ahead and set up an exposure bracket right now. And so I like using aperture priority. So this is a good place to have this. We're already in aperture priority. The bracket button up on top is something we'll press here. And we will go ahead and dial over. Let's do five frames. And we could adjust very small increment, be one third stop. Most people won't need this. Most people want a little bit more and you can go all the way up to three stop. We'll go ahead and do a one stop bracket. This is a pretty normal bracket. Over on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see the different indicators of where these exposures are going to be. Let me just make an adjustment to two thirds stops and you can see how it's a little bit tighter in and closer to the zero. And if we did two stops, well, it goes beyond the scale. Uh, and so here at one stop, we can see what's going on. And so we're going to go ahead and press down and we took one and now it looks like we're going to take uh, the dark one and less dark one, a little bit bright and very bright one. And so there's our five exposures. And if we play this back, we can see that this one by the bottom of the screen, you can see this is the plus two and then the plus one our minus one, minus two. And then there's our normal exposure and our corresponding histogram. So you can learn about histograms by doing this. Now, the other thing that I would do, and I'm going to jump ahead of myself for just a moment, is I am going to put this camera in a continuous mode. We'll just put it in the low mode for right now. And if I want to shoot through this whole series, I'm just going to press down on the shutter release and hold it down continuously. And it's going to shoot through all five, but then it will stop. And so it did so uh, as quickly as possible. And that's how I would normally shoot a bracket series. And so this is really good if you, as I say, going to be doing HDR photography or you just want to make sure that you are getting the correct exposure. Now, warning, most important thing is to remember to turn it off because the camera is still in that mode. And if you look at my camera, yes, it is still on. And so I better go in here and turn it off. And you'll notice that off is 0F. Now, does 0F stand for zero frames, or is it off with a misspelled missing F? Don't know. Kind of doesn't matter because they both mean the same thing. It's turned off. All right, high dynamic range. I just mentioned that about bracketing. Well, the camera has its own built in high dynamic range, uh, which they actually call HDR overlay. Now, the big downside to this is it is in JPEG only. You cannot shoot this in RAW. And what this is doing is it's going to shoot a series of photos, brighter and darker, and it's going to combine them in camera so that you can have an HDR image in camera rather than the traditional way of shooting three or more images and then taking some software on a computer and compiling it, putting it all together. That's a lot of fuss and a lot of work. 
It also uses a really good computer for doing that, and you end up with a very good result uh, when you spend that extra time. The camera can do it on its own. It's pretty good, but I think a lot of people who are into HDR will find that this is limiting. But if you want to dip your toes into the HDR lake, well, this is a good place to do it. Now, the first option is to turn it on or off. Normally, it's left off, of course. You can choose to be shooting a single photo, or if you're going to be doing HDR for a bunch of stuff, you can leave it on for a series so you don't have to keep turning it on. With single photo, it turns off after it's done its little thing. You can set the strength if you want to low, normal, high, extra high, or auto where it will adjust the exposure according to the need of that particular lighting scenario. If you want to see what these look like, I've shot in the studio something that is brightly lit and something that is in the shadows. And you can see what it's doing is it's brightening up the subject in the shadows and it's trying to hold back the brightness of the brighter subject. Now we're going to leave the whole subject of does this look like reality? That's a separate subject we're not going to get into right now. But if you want to experiment with this, uh, it is going to give you a JPEG image with uh, information from multiple images to produce one image that kind of has everything in a closer tonal band uh, so that it can be more easily seen. And you can actually take a look at this when you look at the histogram and you'll see that it's essentially squishing the information towards the middle of the histogram. It's bringing down the highlights and bringing up the shadows and dark areas. Now the final option in here is to save individual raw images. So when I say this is JPEG only, the result is JPEG. You can shoot this while you're in RAW, and by turning this last feature on, you can save those individual RAW images from the underexposed image and the overexposed image. That way, if you're not happy with what the camera does, you can take those individual RAW images and plug them into your computer and use other post-production software and potentially work a better solution out than what the in-camera's JPEG was. And as I say, the in-camera processing, it's, this is a great camera and all, but it's, it's not a computer uh, in that regard. It's not as powerful as a computer. And so it has limitations on what it can do and uh, the style of that particular look. And so, as I say, this is a good way to get uh, started with HDR photography and experiment a little bit with it. But I highly re recommend keeping those raw images. That way you can work with the original information later on. Active D-lighting is kind of like HDR, but in a single shot. This is where the camera is going to take an image and it's going to brighten the shadows. It's going to hold back the highlights and it's just going to save it in a single JPEG and it does it with a singular image. And this might be important because when you're shooting HDR, because you're shooting multiple images, you can't really shoot anything that's moving and you really shouldn't be even hand holding the camera because you want everything exactly in the same spot. With active D-lighting, you could be shooting a wedding where things are all in movement um, or anything that you want that's moving around because this is just capturing individual images and it's working with the software to adjust the tones in the image itself. Now what this looks like, we have different low, normal, high, extra high, extra high too, and it's doing the same thing that happens in HDR, is it's raising the shadows and it's holding back on the highlights. It does a reasonably good job. I would say that a photographer with just a little bit of education is going to be able to surpass this with a raw image in any post-production software. So this is something that you can easily do on your own, but it does take time. And so if this is something that you want adjusted in camera for immediate results, yeah, it can work for some people in some situations in here. All right, there is going to be some additional information when it comes to setting the exposure up when we get into the photo shooting menu. There'll be a lot of detailed settings that we can get into in there. And then in the custom settings menu, there are some more fine-tuned custom controls in there that we'll be going through later on in this class. So there you go, folks. As I said, a lot going on with the exposure control. So experiment with uh, many of those different options that we took a look at in there. Do some sample exposures. Try shooting outside your comfort zone in the modes that you're not as familiar with just to learn to see where they might be beneficial in the types of work that you do. So there you go. Have fun with your exposures.